Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. Amid the sprawling tapestry of English history, some figures, though draped in royal lineage and standing at a crossroad of dynastic change, still remain largely in the shadows, and Arbella Stewart is one such figure. Born at a time of political upheaval and religious discord, her very existence was a testament to the tangled web of the Tudor bloodline and looming question of succession. The absence of a direct heir from Elizabeth I threw the country into a quagmire of conspiracies, power plays, and anticipation, and Arbella Stewart was right at the center of that, and that's who we're going to talk about today. Before we get started, though, your reminder about TudorCon. So you can't buy tickets to come in person anymore. I'm very sorry. I have closed those ticket sales. But you can come through the magic of the internet with the streaming ticket, and the streaming ticket is awesome. We've got some really cool stuff planned, including a Tudor cook-along video with Brigitte Webster, who has a new book out called Eating with the Tudors. Um, also, we will be having an exclusive showing of Michael Ratty's musical, The King's Legacy. So um, that's for streaming tickets, too. So it's going to be super cool. EnglandCast.com slash TudorCon online to learn more about the streaming ticket. Again, EnglandCast.com slash TudorCon online. All right, let's get into Arbella Stewart. Within the swirling vortex of courtly intrigue, the name Arbella Stewart surfaced again and again. Here was a young woman whose veins carried the legitimate Tudor blood through her grandmother, Margaret Douglas, a direct descendant of the House of Tudor. Yet, how many of us have actually heard her story? As we embark on this journey into Arbella's life, we're not just delving into the story of a potential queen. We're unraveling a narrative that encapsulates the very essence of Elizabethan and Jacobean eras. From the cold stone walls of the Tower of London to the courts and the greatest monarchs, from clandestine love letters to audacious escape attempts, Arbella's story isn't just about her claim to the throne. It's about a woman who was both a pawn and a player in a grander game and the personal sacrifices that came with her royal birthright. In today's episode, we're going to travel back through time, shedding light on the enigma that is Arbella Stewart, retracing her footsteps and unveiling a tale as captivating as any crowned monarch of England. To truly understand the weight of Arbella's claim, we need to first step back and examine the Tudor family tree. Arbella Stewart was born on October 3rd, 1575, in Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire. She was the child of Charles Stewart, the Earl of Lennox, and Elizabeth Cavendish. Her birthplace, Hardwick Hall, was the brainchild of Arbella's grandmother, the formidable Bess of Hardwick. From her earliest days surrounded by such opulence and heritage, Arbella's life was deeply intertwined with the rich tapestry of English royalty. It was clear from the beginning that her destiny would be anything but ordinary. Arbella's paternal grandmother, Margaret Douglas, held a significant place in the family saga. Margaret was the daughter of Margaret Tudor, eldest daughter of Henry VII, and sister to Henry VIII. This direct connection to the Tudors was solidified further through the marriage as Margaret Douglas wed Matthew Stewart, the fourth Earl of Lennox. The Lennox connection was crucial, too. It was a lineage that though initially from Scotland, intertwined deeply with England's royal chronicles. The birth of Arbella's father, Charles Stuart, the Earl of Lennox, further cemented this legacy. When he married Elizabeth Cavendish, Arbella's lineage boasted a dual heritage, one part Tudor through her grandmother, Margaret Douglas, and one part English nobility, courtesy of the Cavendishes, a prominent family in the Elizabethan court. Given this lineage, it's not difficult to see why Arbella's claim to the throne was taken seriously by many. In a time when the Tudor dynasty was waning, with Elizabeth I aging and childless, the realm was rife with anxiety about succession. Elizabeth's reluctance, or perhaps inability, to name an heir left a vacuum, causing the English court and European monarchies to speculate and strategize. In this soup, anyone with a drop of Tudor blood became a contender, and Arbella's claim was as legitimate as any, given her proximity to the main Tudor line. Yet it's essential to understand that Arbella's claim was not just about blood. It was about the broader narrative of the era, the religious divide between Catholicism and Protestantism. 
With the Protestant Reformation still fresh and England having broken away from the Catholic Church, Arabella, viewed by some as potentially leaning towards Catholicism due to her Lennox lineage, represented an opportunity for Catholic forces in Europe. She was seen as a symbol of hope for those who wished to revert England back to Catholicism, making her both a beacon for some and a threat for others. Bess of Hardwick, born Elizabeth Hardwick, is a figure who looms large, not just in Arbella's story, but in English history as a whole. And we've done several episodes on her because she highly deserves them. Rising from relatively humble beginnings, Bess would go on to become one of the wealthiest and most influential women of her time, second only to Queen Elizabeth. Four marriages, each strategically aligned and ascending in status, catapulted Bess into the echelons of the English nobility. Her last marriage to George Talbot, the sixth Earl of Shrewsbury, cemented her position at the heart of England's political and social circles. But Bess wasn't just a woman of wealth and influence. She was a shrewd operator, a formidable matriarch, and a masterful builder. Her most famous architectural feat, Hardwick Hall, with its emblematic proclamation, Hardwick Hall More Glass Than Wall, was a testament to her audacity and ambition. Its large windows, a luxury in the Elizabethan age, symbolized her transparent ambitions and vast wealth. Into this world of opulence, power plays, and political maneuvering, Arbella Stewart was born and under the watchful eye of Bess, she was raised. Arbella's parents died when she was young, leaving her in the guardianship of her grandmother. For Bess, Arbella was not just a beloved granddaughter, but also a living embodiment of potential and promise. Bess knew all too well the weight of Arbella's royal lineage, and she was determined to ensure that her granddaughter was prepared for whatever destiny had in store. While Bess's estate provided a safe haven, it was also a crucible for young Arbella. Bess instilled in her a sense of her royal identity, ensuring she received an education befitting a potential queen. Arbella was trained in languages, music, needlework, and scriptures. Equally, she was made aware of the political intrigues that surrounded her birthright. The Tudor court, with its ever-shifting alliances and undercurrents, was a frequent topic of discussion. Yet for all the formality and expectations, Bess's influence was not solely that of a stern matriarch shaping a royal heir. There were moments of tenderness shared between grandmother and her charge. Through letters and accounts, we catch glimpses of their bond. Bess's concern for Arbella's health, her letters filled with advice, warnings, occasional reprimands, but always underscored by deep-seated affection. In understanding Arbella's formative years, one cannot overlook the pivotal role played by Bess. Her indomitable spirit and her political acumen, her unwavering belief in Arbella's destiny, would leave an indelible mark on the young Stuart heiress. Another figure that, of course, loomed large over Arbella would be Elizabeth I, with her resolute decision to neither marry nor name an heir. She had inadvertently cultivated a hotbed of speculation and conspiracy. As she aged and the future of the Tudor dynasty seemed uncertain, eyes inevitably turned towards anyone with a drop of Tudor blood. In this environment, Arbella's claim, rooted in her Tudor lineage, made her a natural focal point. For the Protestant faction at court, the specter of Catholicism remained an ever-present threat. The religious Reformation had divided Europe and England's break from the Roman Catholic Church was still a recent memory. This made any claimant with even a hint of Catholic sympathies, real or imagined, both a rallying point for Catholic hopes and a source of anxiety for the Protestant establishment. Given the Lennox connection and its perceived Catholic leanings, there were those who saw Arbella as a potential Catholic queen, a restoration of the old faith on English shores. However, public perception wasn't uniformly one-dimensional. For many, Arbella was a symbol of English stability. As Europe's monarchies watched the English succession drama with bated breath, many within England yearned for a seamless, uncontroversial transition. In Arbella, they saw continuity, a bridge between the Tudor past and a hopeful future. Yet the court was a place of whispers, a realm where rumor often held as much power as fact. Arbella's every move, her friendships, her letters, even her personal beliefs became fodder for speculation. Was she loyal to the Protestants, or did she secretly harbor Catholic sympathies? 
Did she have ambitions to claim the throne, or was she content in her role as a potential heir? James VI of Scotland's ascent to the English throne, as James I, added another layer of complexity. Though he was a cousin and, by many accounts, held Arbella in fond regard, her proximity to the throne naturally made their relationship fraught with political undercurrents. To the public, Arbella's life was a narrative of potential, a story that intertwined hope, ambition, and the looming question of what if. To courtiers, she was both an asset and an enigma, someone to be watched, courted, and at times controlled. When James VI of Scotland was declared James I of England in 1603, uniting the crowns of both kingdoms, the political landscape underwent a seismic shift. For Arbella, this period was one of profound personal and political ramifications. James's ascension might have provided some clarity to the succession question, but it by no means eliminated the intrigues that surrounded Arbella. Initially, there was hope for her. After all, James and Arbella were first cousins. They shared a lineage that could have been a bridge to a close bond, and in many ways it was. James invited her to court, bestowed upon her a generous allowance, and for a while it seemed that Arbella had found a secure place in the new Stuart dynasty. However, the realities of royal politics are seldom straightforward. Arbella's position, close to the throne yet not on it, rendered her a figure of enduring interest and speculation. Her every action, even her potential marital alliances, became matters of state concern. Any suitor of Arbella's was not merely courting a lady, he was potentially aligning with a claim to the throne. This made her personal life a topic of national significance. One such romantic entanglement, her relationship with William Seymour, the Duke of Somerset, and a descendant of Catherine Grey, was also a descendant of Henry VII, brought this to a head. Their affection for each other was undeniable. However, their union would signify the joining of two claimants to the throne, something that was viewed with deep suspicion. Their clandestine marriage in 1610, without the king's permission, led to their imprisonment. A love story which, in any other context might have been celebrated, became a symbol of political defiance. The marriage between Arbella and William Seymour was not just a personal matter, but a political conundrum. The merging of two claims to the English throne was not something that James I could ignore, given the historical challenges of Tudor and Stuart succession. Upon discovering the clandestine union, James acted decisively. He saw this union as a threat to the stability of his reign. The newlyweds were promptly arrested, William was sent to the Tower of London, while Arbella Stuart found herself confined to Sir Thomas Perry's house in Lambeth. Arbella's life, once filled with the possibilities of royalty, was now marked by solitude and confinement. Yet her spirit remained undimmed. Separated from her husband and under constant watch, she orchestrated a daring escape plan. By 1611, her situation had become increasingly desperate. Imprisoned and separated from her beloved, she found herself under the watchful eye of Sir James Croft at his house in Barnet. Despite the scrutiny, her spirit was not easily caged. In the time leading up to her escape, Arbella began a calculated performance. She feigned bouts of illness, effectively reducing her guards' vigilance as they believed her to be too weak to attempt an escape. This act also granted her some increased privacy, which she used to her advantage. Arbella and William, although physically separated, had managed to establish a secret line of communication. Using this, they meticulously planned their escapes to be executed simultaneously, hoping to reunite and flee England for a life on the continent. As part of this plan, Arbella's maid played a pivotal role. Risking her safety, the maid smuggled men's clothing into the house in Barnet. On the appointed day in 1611, Arbella donned the male attire, a move that greatly reduced the chances of her recognition. With her appearance transformed and exploiting the decreased guard vigilance due to her illness, Arbella successfully evaded her captors. She traveled from Barnet to Blackwell, hoping to rendezvous with William. Simultaneously, William had orchestrated his own escape. Using a wig and a false beard to alter his appearance, he managed to elude his captors at the Tower of London and aimed to reunite with Arbella. However, despite their meticulous planning, fate did not favor the pair. A series of delays and miscommunications marred their escape. They missed their rendezvous, and William, unaware of Arbella's whereabouts, decided to continue on to Flanders. 
Arbella's ship, delayed while she awaited William, was eventually pursued and intercepted by English authorities before she could reach the relative safety of Calais. Arbella was captured and brought back to England. Audacious attempt combined with the political implications of her union with William led to a stricter and more punishing confinement in the Tower of London. The grim surroundings and her separation from William took a significant toll on her health and spirit, and in 1615 this potential heir to the English throne passed away in the confines of the Tower, her life a tapestry of ambition, love, and tragedy. So for now, we're going to stop it here. Hop into the Tudor Learning Circle, tutorlearningcircle.com, a social network just for Tudor history nerds to discuss Arbella and all things Tudor. And remember to check out the TudorCon streaming tickets at englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. We are just a month away now. It's crazy. So englandcast.com slash TudorCon online. Thank you so much for listening, and I will speak with you again very soon. Blow northern wind, a sandal may be sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoor te boor in bouwrebriek, dat soel is samlie.